Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to all present here today and those of you who are connected online. Thank you for joining us uh, for the European Union delegation to Singapore's event on the EU strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. We have with us today in Singapore the EU Special Envoy for the Indo-Pacific, uh, Mr. Gabriel de Vicentin, who will be addressing us in just a few minutes. Moderating the conversation today is Ambassador Ong Keng Yong, Executive Deputy Chairman of the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, RSIS, and Director of the Institute of Defense and Strategic Studies. Thank you, Ambassador Ong, for your time. To start our proceedings, I invite now the European Union Ambassador to Sim Singapore, Ivona Pyorko, to deliver her remarks. Ambassador, please, if you could just give us 10 seconds because the mic has to be clean, but yeah. Ambassador Ong Keng Yong, fellow ambassadors, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are here to talk today about the Indo-Pacific and that's what we are going to hopefully do. But before, I obviously will say at least two words about Ukraine. Uh, I'll repeat what uh, European Union presidents and HRVP Borrell have said in the very first reaction, they are now together with the leaders of Europe debating it further. The European Union strongly condemns Russia's unjustified attack on Ukraine. And in these dark hours, our thoughts are with Ukraine and the innocent women, men and children as they face this unprovoked attack and fear for their lives. Let me continue on the subject we can hopefully focus further, although the links are obvious and I'm sure we are going to touch upon them during our discussion. Uh, so once again, welcome and thank you for joining us together in person and online. And I'm really very grateful for my old good friend, Gabriele Vicentin, EU Special Envoy for the Indo-Pacific, to have made way here to Singapore. And we are really particularly privileged to have him here today because he, uh, basically has arrived here straight from Paris, where we hold the Ministerial Forum for the Cooperation in Indo-Pacific by all our uh, European foreign ministers and above all, all our foreign ministers, our friends from the region. Uh, so really Singapore is the first country he's visiting just after and I'm sure we are going to hear about this uh, a lot. Uh, the meeting was obviously chaired by HRVP Joseph Borrell together with the French Presidency, French Foreign Minister Jean-Yves Le Drian. The Foreign Minister of Singapore, uh, Vivian Balakrishnan, was of course also participating and actually chaired one of the most important roundtables, the roundtable on connectivity and digital together with European Commissioner for International Partnerships, Jutta Urpilainen. Digital is one of the most important subjects in our strategy for cooperation on in the Pacific and very important for Singapore. Those that follow Singapore closer know that this is something we've really uh, uh, started to cooperate very closely in the recent months. Another reason why this event is special to me is that this is actually the very first event in person or, or at least hybrid and not only virtual that uh, the European Union t uh, delegation to Singapore uh, organized since my arrival half a year ago. So I extend really big thanks to my own team, uh, which is small but beautiful and working very hard every day. The Indo-Pacific is an important region for the EU and the mere fact that despite the situation, amidst the dark developments in the EU Eastern neighborhood, we did demonstrate our commitment to this region even now with the successful organization of Ministerial Forum for Cooperation in the Pacific, and I obviously led the special uh, envoy to tell us more about that. We do see multilateralism and the respect for the rules-based order being increasingly contested, and I think today shows it more than ever. And this is why, for our security and prosperity, it is key to closely work together with our partners in this dynamic region. We are closely interconnected. What happens here in the Indo-Pacific has an impact on peace 
and prosperity in Europe, and vice versa. ASEAN and Singapore lie at the heart of this region, so I can only look forward to our discussion today and thank you once more for coming here in person and for being us, with us online. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Piorko, for this very timely reminder on the dark developments um, in, that are happening and the need for the multilateral order and, and the rules-based order. And we're all looking forward very much to hearing about this from the EU Special Envoy for the Indo-Pacific, Mr. Gabriel Vicentin. I hand over the stage to you. I haven't taken my microphone off, so that should save you 10 seconds. Thank you. Ambassador Young, dear Ivona, ambassadors, excellencies, dear guests. Uh, I would start by taking you by surprise, saying that it's a real honor and a pleasure to be here today. Uh, but I really mean it, um, and it, this is not just the classical opening line. Uh, it is very timely that this event was organized, that takes place, it is the first event in the region after the Paris Ministerial Forum, and it is the first uh, official uh, EU event uh, happening in these uh, hours uh, uh, with the latest development to which the, the, the ambassador hinted to. So I flew directly from the conference to, to Singapore, and I would uh, first of all thank the participants to the Paris Forum, including the Singapore Foreign Minister for having taken the time to fly down and to chair the roundtable on, on connectivity. I would like to thank as well the French Presidency uh, for having taken the initiative to organize this ministerial forum in cooperation with the EU and the EIS. And I have to underline that already the mere fact of having a ministerial forum for the first time ever held is a great political achievement. So a lot of praise to the French presidency and to our regional partners for having made a ministerial forum a success. So, of course, our attention today is focused very much on the warring developments which are happening in, in Ukraine. But despite of this, we cannot uh, avoid turning to the Indo-Pacific. It would be a great mistake because we, the EU is a geopolitical power, has to look at the world globally. The future of the world is, of course, in the Indo-Pacific, but the present is already in the Indo-Pacific, both in geoeconomical and geopolitical terms. So the Indo-Pacific region and Europe together represent more than 70% of world trade of goods and services. The Indo-Pacific produces 60% 60% of the world GDP, and it is the second destination of EU export. On top of this, 40% of trade towards the EU comes from the Indo-Pacific. 1.6 million EU citizens reside in the Indo-Pacific, so this is something that is often forgotten. The EU is a resident actor of the Indo-Pacific, through France, of course, but I'm sure that my French colleagues will allow me to consider uh, French citizens as EU citizens as well. Last but not least, last but not least, two billion persons 
will join the middle class in 10 years' time in the Indo-Pacific region. And this will not only be a formidable economic opportunity for development, but it will also pose serious concerns in terms of climate change and effects on the uh, uh, green economy. So the Indo-Pacific is undoubtedly uh, the most dynamic region of the world, but, but the regional order is put more and more under threat. And the geopolitical competition between the United States and China is obviously intensifying. So this risks to have a direct impact on security and prosperity of the country of the region, but as rightly Ivona said, also on the EU. We therefore have a vital interest in order for the regional order to remain open and based on rules. We, as European Union, want to contribute to peace, to stability and to prosperity. Our future, the EU and of the Indo-Pacific, is connected. And this is why our cooperation and our partnership are so paramountly important. So, after this introduction, let's go a little bit on Paris, on the forum. First of all, the ministerial forum in Paris is the first of its kind. It has not adopted formal conclusions, and it's absolutely not legally binding. So it's a political gathering, the first of its kind. It allowed a free exchange, but it also uh, came out with a list of items for cooperation and uh, possible uh, deliverables in the short to medium term. So the main uh, overarching decision and agreement was on the fact that the EU and its Indo-Pacific partners want to work together to maintain a free and open Indo-Pacific for all, building on strong and lasting partnerships. And some concrete actions have been identified for the future of our relations. So the EU will aim to promote all dimensions of connectivity with Indo-Pacific partners in a strategic manner, building on the global gateway strategy. Then the Comprehensive Air Transport Agreement, CATA, between the EU and ASEAN member states in a, is an example of a major initiative which will enhance people-to-people -people connectivity between the two regions. And this is the first ever uh, agreement between multinational organizations. And we have many other examples of EU support on renewable energy, water, and health infrastructures across the region. On digital issues, the forum discussed the contribution of digital economy, infrastructure, and education to the transformation of economies and societies. We also exchanged views on the need for an open, safe, secure, and human-centric internet. The forum also expressed support for the rapid conclusion of the negotiations, or of the launch of negotiations, for digital partnerships between the EU and Japan, South Korea, and of course, Singapore. So we really hope that the negotiations will be launched soon and concluded soon as well. Possibly still within the year 2022. The EU will also work with Indo-Pacific partners to reinforce value chains by strengthening and diversifying our trade relations. On global issues, our discussions have reiterated the importance of working together to fight mitigate and adapt to climate change and to counter biodiversity loss, pollution and other forms of environmental degradation. And on this allow me to open specific parentheses to Singapore. I welcome very warmly the decision Singapore government took two years ago uh, about the adaptation of the budget in terms of increasing its uh, uh, commitment towards uh, a green economy and, and, and fighting climate change. This is a most welcome initiative which goes perfectly in line with the EU Indo-Pacific strategy. The fate of humankind depends, depends on it, on the fight of climate change. And above all here in the Indo-Pacific. And we will work with the EU member states to put forward 
a green alliance, and a green partnership in the whole region. It is also important in this chapter to take forward action to strengthen ocean governance in full compliance with international law and in particular UNCLOS and its implementation. Finally, on security and defense, we have reaffirmed our commitment to work together to foster a rules-based international order and, in particular, of course, the freedom of navigation. Today, the EU and the in its Indo-Pacific partners are facing the same challenges. Hybrid threats, weaponization of inter interdependence, where information, vaccines, data, and technology standards become instruments of political competition. Or the increased contestation of our access to the high seas, outer space, and the digital sphere. So through its Indo-Pacific strategy, the EU intends to increase its engagement with the Indo-Pacific region to build partnerships that help us addressing these global challenges. The EU will seek to promote an open and rules-based regional security architecture. In concrete terms, we will include secure sea lines of communication, capacity building, and an enhanced naval presence by EU member states in the Indo-Pacific. As a concrete example, the EU adopted the extension of the EU coordinated maritime presence in the Northwest Indian Ocean on the 22nd of February. So the EU member states already are already present with their navies in the region, including with a European-led mission like in the Strait of Hormuz. So with this coordinated maritime presence, we want to further support stability and security in the Indo-Pacific region in order to optimize naval deployment and strengthen cooperation with coastal states. And we have had a good first pilot project on coordinated maritime presence in the Gulf of Guinea. So in Paris, we moved from words to actions soon, hopefully. And I would like then conclude by thanking you member states this time first, and the Indo-Pacific partners for having made the forum a success and for having allowed me to be here today and talk about it. Thank you very much and looking forward to the debate. Mr. Vicentin, I'll request you to stay on stage and I would invite now Ambassador Ong King Yong to moderate the conversation with you. Thank you, Ambassador Ong. Thank you, Gabriel, for that summary of what transpired in Paris and uh, what ASEAN and EU will do going forward. Yeah, I think it's a good um, initiative. And as you have heard, the ambassador of EU to Singapore and now uh, special envoy of EU to Indo-Pacific, Europe has always been here. It's just that over time, other more interesting things appear on the scene and then we take each other for granted. But in the last 50 years, I think the European Union has advanced tremendously, especially with regard to looking after the interests of its consumers, the people sector. Yeah. I think this is something that ASEAN countries uh, will be looking at more closely. However, ASEAN as a group, we are very much focused on trade, investment, and now digitalization. As we have heard Gabriel mention just now, the future of ASEAN revolving around the digital economy is something very real. And our population of 650 million plus in Southeast Asia 
many of them are digitally savvy. And they now don't go to the mom and pop shop or go to big company to buy things or do things. They all do online. I'm very sure they are asking me questions now on this little uh, pad that we have here. Yeah. But anyway, the potential for digitalization, digital economy, digital partnership is really very significant. And it is good that both the European countries as well as the ASEAN countries are now more or less aligned and more importantly committed to do something more substantial for our respective region going forward. A few days ago, one of my friends in America asked me, what are we doing to maximize the potential of ASEAN? Because in his calculation, from his reading, by 2030, ASEAN collectively, the 10 countries, our region here, will be the fourth largest uh, economy in the world, after the US, after China, after EU. Collectively, ASEAN will be number four in terms of GDP and in terms of our growth, both traditional sector as well as digitalized sector. Yeah. So, 2030 is only eight years away, yeah? Not long, no? <laughs> and uh, everybody should get very excited because uh, we, it's not a long time to go. Yeah, we in all of lifetime here, all of us here. Yeah. So it's something that we need to uh, think about substantially and be prepared for it. So the good thing, as I always say, is that we have the European Union model. It has already been tested out over the last uh, several decades. And ASEAN, the smartest thing we can do is don't reinvent the wheel, as we say. We just follow what has been tried tested in Europe, and then we apply it here to give it our own Southeast Asian character. You know? As China said, Chinese economy is uh, international, multilateral economy with Chinese characteristics. So we just uh, do the same thing here with Southeast Asian characteristics, but looking from or learning from the European um, experience. So in the interest of time, I think maybe we should try to uh, encourage some discussion, some uh, uh, exchange between us, and then we can maybe open the uh, floor to the participant here as well as people online. Thank you. Uh, if you allow me, maybe since you mentioned ASEAN, before we turn to the questions, I would really like to underline an important point. Uh, it is the fact that the relations between the EU and ASEAN are considered to be really a, a keystone in, uh, in our overall approach towards the, the, the Indo-Pacific. Uh, it is, the ASEAN is the uh, uh, multinational organization with which we have the deepest, strongest and longest relations. With this year, we will celebrate the 45th anniversary of the relations between the EU and ASEAN with a summit in, in, in Brussels at the, at the end in mid-December and the beginning of December. Um, and so it will uh, not just be uh, an occasion to celebrate, but it will be an occasion to relaunch and uh, reinforce our relations because not uh, longer than two years ago, or, yeah, two years ago, uh, the relations between the EU and ASEAN have stepped up to a strategic partnership uh, degree. So it's, uh, the, our relation with ASEAN has joined the, the level of intensity that we enjoy with the biggest and most like-minded partners. So it's an acknowledgement of the fact that ASEAN is central to us. Uh, in trade, in investment, in digitalizations, as you said, but also we welcome very much the potential of cooperation in terms of defense and security with ASEAN. Uh, 
Lastly, our relations with ASEAN are the evidence of the fact that we, as EU, are totally committed to multilateralism and international rules-based order. And the uh, uh, relation and the implementation of any possible kind of cooperation with ASEAN really shows it. So I, I really wanted to make, to make this point because it's, it's really paramount for, for us. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and sorry for taking more time. Switch it on. No, it's on. Okay, it's on. Yeah. And you can take your masks off because you don't have shared microphones. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. We can take them off. Yes, yes. Oh, thank you so yeah, much. Thank you. Okay. I that will be jealous people. Yeah. Yeah. They are quite distant <laughs> from us. Uh. I, I I like your uh, emphasis on multilateralism and I think both of us in EU and in ASEAN. We really have to rely on multilateral uh, framework, both for the trade and investment flow, as well as for our people-to-people -people, uh, connection. Going forward, I think what is important uh, is to explain a bit more the EU strategy for Indo-Pacific, because uh, yeah, our people here, our countries here, uh, they are excited by this is by this uh, particular um, articulation. Uh, it is really, for me, is an update of what you are really doing here in uh, Southeast Asia in the yeah. ASEAN region. But uh, now the language and the uh, ideas have become more synchronized with the broader developments that affect us in our region because we have other bigger countries that say that they also have their own Indo-Pacific strategy. And then we have uh, a bigger country up north that say that it is not Indo-Pacific, but it's Asia-Pacific. Uh, but you look at the map, it's the same geography. So whether you call it Asia-Pacific or Indo-Pacific, we take it as it comes. Yeah, the important thing is to have practical result on the ground. So it is good that uh, there is this kind of interest, but going forward, we have to make sure we sustain it. Yeah. So I think maybe you like to talk a bit about uh, what you have heard in Paris, not only from the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Singapore, but from the other ASEAN delegation, how they see themselves uh, contributing to sustaining this relationship. You mentioned about the other dimension of the relationship. So for me, coming from my background, from the ASEAN Days, I would say that you can do a lot more in many of the other ASEAN-centered mechanisms. Uh, European Union has always been active in the ASEAN Regional Forum, yep. which is uh, devoted to political security and uh, defense-related issues, and through various workshops and other kind of uh, cooperation, we learn a lot about each other's way of conducting. Uh, security cooperation, maritime, uh, maritime uh, activities, yeah, and um, uh, simple things like, you know, rescues at sea, yeah, uh, military medicine exchange, yeah, <laughs> all these things that people take for granted, but uh, there are things that are going on at the ASEAN Regional Forum. Maybe we have to highlight it a bit more. Yeah, otherwise people think that uh, we are just always talking about trade and flow of money mm -hmm. and tourists. Yeah, more is actually happening on the ground. And so perhaps one idea is to do more publicity, talk a bit more. Yeah. And many people forget about this uh, ASEF, you know? We have a thing called Asia Europe Foundation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which actually spend a lot of time and resources on cultural, educational, scientific exchanges. Yeah. So things are uh, uh, going on in this kind of forum and it is important for our Southeast Asian citizens to know the extent to which uh, the European Union has been involved with us. Yeah. Thank you, Ambassador Roman. You raised a lot, a lot of, of issues, all of them really worth uh, a, a big reflection. Uh, if you allow me, I will start from the last, uh, I, yeah, the last issues you mentioned, um, the cultural and educational 
exchanges. Normally, we, we don't take so much care of them, whereas it is probably the most important in the terms of long-run relations. Uh, one of the outcomes of Paris is that it has been decided to strengthen the uh, Erasmus Plus uh, uh, program towards the Indo-Pacific. So this is the exchange of students, the possibility for students from the Indo-Pacific to come and uh, uh, do one or two semesters uh, in European universities. That's very important. But also the uh, strengthening or the opening, actually, of the uh, Marie Curie uh, uh, program, which is about the mobility of researchers uh, towards the Indo-Pacific region as well. So even without being associated to uh, Horizon Europe, which is the framework R&D program of the EU, there is the possibility for uh, researchers from the Indo-Pacific region to take part in the Marie Curie, uh, uh, we call them fellowships or mobility of researchers. So please, uh, uh, in terms of cultural or educational exchanges, we have really moved forward. Still, it's on a, on a, on a bilateral uh, uh, country to EU level. It's not with ASEAN, but it's open to the, to the Indo-Pacific countries as such. Uh, yes, the ASEAN Regional Forum, the EU, has active part in that, and we can only welcome uh, every kind of strengthening and enlargement of participation, activities, and, and strengthening of, of our relations. And I would also like to thank ASEAN, because ASEAN was the first, let's call it, entity to welcome the EU strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. So the first ever uh, communique uh, welcoming the EU strategy came from our ASEAN friends. So I, I am extremely grateful for this. Uh, you mentioned, well, let's go on the semantic. You, you talk about Asia-Pacific or Indo-Pacific. I think that nowadays this connotation uh, has, uh, in our view, lost a little bit of momentum. I mean, um, it's a key that Indo-Pacific is a neutral way of addressing uh, a region that in our, in our view, uh, uh, in our definitions, goes from the eastern, uh, uh, eastern coast of Africa towards the uh, Pacific Islands. Uh, we don't consider in our uh, Indo-Pacific strategy the American Pacific coast, no, both northern and southern. We stop at, at the Pacific Islands. Um, so there is really no uh, political connotation. It's just a geographical expression in our in our view, um, which has this this geographical extension I just mentioned. So that there is no no no. It, it's simply factual. Um, yeah, I mean you mentioned cooperation in in various in various aspects. The 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 security, management of the sea, uh, medicines, obviously, and, and vaccines. But this is something that we have uh, worked a lot and with extremely, extremely good results. Uh, you know, uh, the uh, EU has been the biggest world exporters of uh, vaccines, but has also been the biggest donors of vaccine because uh, we are both a producer who sell the vaccine. So, for example, uh, Singapore procured a lot of uh, vaccines from the EU, but we are also the biggest donor to the COVAX uh, uh, system. So, and this has also uh, uh, been done in cooperation with with, with ASEAN, with the member states, and, and with its and with its member states. And it's a really a big success. It took some time to gear up. <laughs> it took some time to give gear up. I acknowledge that, but uh, nowadays we have reached a, a, a level of quantity level, which is totally satisfactory. Of course, more can be done and will be done. We are envisaging further measures for that, even to boost the capacity, the production capacities uh, in the region, but that's that we will, we will see. I would like to underline, because you mentioned trade and economic relations, but also others, but I would like to underline once again the trade and economic relations as the key vector for good relations. And I would just take the example of Singapore, with whom we have a free trade agreement. In COVID times, 
the average decrease of the EU's trade relations with the world went down between 10 and 12 percent, basically. With Singapore, it went down by 5 percent, so less than half than the average. So I'm tempted to say that this is a benefit of a well-crafted and well-implemented FTA. So it in, in, in crisis times, it minimizes the effect of the crisis. So again, uh, let's bear in mind that the trade and the good trade and good economic relations are, are a key vector for good relations overall. So we should try to move quickly to do a EU ASEAN free trade agreement, no? I was specifically mentioned country to country, so let's let's <laughs> uh, let's keep it to that. Let's keep it to that. Well, because I think uh, the optics is important, uh, region to region. Yeah, of course, in each of our region, we have very unique uh, 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 nation state, and then uh, due to different policies. Yeah, but I want to say that from my ASEAN background, our current ASEAN community vision, or what we call the ASEAN blueprint uh, for community building and uh, integration. We are in 2022, and that first blueprint 10 years from 2015 to 2025. You know? And I can tell you that the ASEAN leaders have already started to set up the committee to plan for the next one. It's supposed to start from 2026. It will take at least two to three years to settle all this. It will be for another 10 years, mm -hmm. the ASEAN Community Blueprint, 2026 to 2035. And this is where a lot of ideas from EU, from um, our existing program, both in EU and ASEAN, can be scrutinized and maybe, you know, we learn from one another and start to lay the ground to put in uh, good ideas, uh, good um, proposal. You mentioned just now in your opening remarks about the digital economy, digital partnership. This is something very significant. And if you look at the numbers in the ASEAN um, calculation, for the next 10 years, our digital economic activities will increase by billions and billions of dollars. So I do not know what am I going to do with um, the new 10-year plan going forward? But because I'm, uh, what do you call it? I'm a dinosaur. I'm struggling with this uh, pet here. Yeah, but, yeah, but, you, but don't people tell me that you don't need a meteorite to kill you. So you yeah, yeah. but the people that. tell me that for the next 10-year uh, ASEAN blueprint for community building, especially economic integration, mm. digital economy, digital partnership, will be a very critical component. So it is important for all of us to start uh, uh, learning from one another, mm -hmm. uh, educating each side on some of the potential areas of cooperation, what are some of the troublesome areas that we should avoid so that we can save time instead of reinventing the wheel. Absolutely. So what you have now as you regulate and develop your EU uh, uh, rules and regulation with regard to digitalization, with regard to the digital economy, and more importantly, <laughs> to manage the enormous impact of big tech company. All this will be important for ASEAN as we plan for the next ten-year blueprint. Yeah, and it's not very far away; it's just two years down the road. So we have to settle everything by the end of twenty uh, twenty-five, I think. Yeah, so it's just. Actually, practically only two years of uh, working uh, working timetable. So it will be good for EU side to start thinking about some of these. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oh, okay. I think in the interest of time, Gabriel, maybe we open up the our discussion here to those of you here on site and those of us on the. Uh, internet system that we have here. With pleasure. Yeah. Is it okay? With pleasure. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so I see here on the on site here, uh, we have somebody yeah, interested in raising questions. Professor Yen Chong, please introduce yourself. You are known to me, but not known to the rest of us here. 
Uh, thanks, Ambassador Young. Uh, Ian Chong, I'm a political scientist from the National University of Singapore. Um, so, um, Mr. Uh, Vistin, you've focused a lot on the um, positives that can be had from uh, EU ASEAN cooperation and also the EU's presence um, in the Indo Pacific. But one of the things that does strike me is that when you talk about free and open Indo Pacific and rules based order, um, the EU tends to have a greater emphasis on restraint on the state, oversight of the state, um, and these sorts of issues that may not be as present um, in this part of the world. So when it gets to um, things like digital connectivity, like the, how much you restrain the state from you know, looking at people's private lives and companies and all that might be a bit different. So I'm wondering how you deal with these sorts of differences um, and what you expect from the region. And secondarily, um, I think when you talk about you, you tried to stay away from the politics, but the rules-based order, I think, also suggests that there may be other entities uh, in the region that have a very different view of what rule, these rules should be and uh, who should be running them and calling the shots. Now, what is the EU's position on these challenges, these efforts to perhaps provide a different set of rules, perhaps to undermine the ones that the uh, EU would prefer? Thank you. Uh, before you answer, I will connect what uh, Professor Chong had uh, raised with one question coming through the internet here. Yeah. Uh, it's also related to what he has also uh, touched on, which is you know, what are the mechanisms the EU can adopt uh, to establish rules-based order in the Indo-Pacific region. I must say, whoever asks this question, we already have uh, various ideas of rules-based and uh, experiences about rules-based, but I think it's good to hear you uh, give your perspective on what other mechanism or what the possible mechanism we can think about to mm -hmm. maybe strengthen this and to tie in with what Yen, Professor Chong has said about you know, your views about how you see this uh, mm -hmm. rule base and what other form and possibilities you have in mind. Yeah. Well, let's be clear, uh, when we say about rules-based, uh, you should not forget an adjective which goes before, which is called international rules-based order. So it's, uh, it's public law which applies, it's UN charter which applies, it's the international multilateral legal framework which applies. It's not uh, rules at the like of the EU <laughs> or at the like of a member state or, 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 or of various states. So. Here, what we call on is the respect of the UN, char the UN Charter, and we call about upon the respect of international rules-based order, rules as set out in the multilateral environment. So uh, this, is, this is what we call by abiding to an international rules-based order. So you don't solve differences by going at war, or you, you, don't, uh, you don't retaliate economically without uh, the being uh, following the rules of the WTO, for example, this kind of, of idea. So when we talk about rules-based, it's not uh, self-imposed <laughs> rules. It's an international rules-based order. This is, this is the, the, the key uh, thing. I think that is important to uh, remind ourselves, yeah? Rules-based order is what is really uh, agreed upon internationally, uh, multilaterally, and your reference to WTO is one example. It's difficult to say you want to have rules based, but you say your rule is the only rule that can be applied. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And now, if you talk, uh, you talked about mechanism. In these days, we are seeing uh, the kind of mechanism which are designed at maintaining the the, the rules are the ones that the US at, at its disposals are mainly sanctions, and, and the sanctions, normally we have mechanism for coordinating the sanctions with, with the UN sanctions mechanisms, with the, and also with the single states which are not part of the EU. So we have mechanisms which allow us to coordinate, for example, with the US, with the UK, with Australia, and so on. So it's, uh, it's uh, you know, the European Union is not a military power as such, and the EU does not have an army, does not have uh, a navy, does not have an air force of its own. It's the member states of the EU which have it, yeah? So on that point, somebody just asked, rules-based, uh, establish rules-based order. 
mostly Western oriented. What about ideas from uh, the newly emerged economy, other countries in, let's say, Asia, uh, Indo Pacific, as we call it today? Yeah. How can they participate in setting some of these uh, rules, especially now that we are digitalization? Yeah. Can there be a process where more of these relevant rules come onto the international setting and be accepted? Is there a way to introduce these in a hmm? non-confrontational manner and get more accepted by more people? Well, How the EU look at it? Well, we, we, we said that we are having now agreements on, 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 on digital cooperation and it, with, for, in the negotiations of the agreement, we will come out with, with a common understanding of what uh, the, the rules uh, which uh, should uh, rule our the relations in, in, digital, in the digital sphere will be. So when we talk about agreement, by definition, you agree on a set of rules which bind yourselves. Okay. Um, I don't know whether Professor Yan Chong is satisfied, but he looks like uh, he wants to have a follow-up. Uh, but can we just hold a line? Let us talk a bit about the next question that I have here from online uh, viewer asking pick, you... Pick the easy ones, not, the, not just the difficult ones. Yeah? Okay, la, I pick an easy one for you. La. <laughs> so, uh, he, he wanted to know uh, about this thing of the digital partnership, which you uh, referenced in your remarks. Yeah, you say a bit more about that and how do we sort of organize ourselves and move forward. Is there any specific that you can refer to? Especially now that you had discussed about this partnership with the Singapore side, and we know in Singapore they have a few of these agreements already uh, signed and settled with some other digitalized economy. So yeah, yeah, I know you have it with the, with Chile and New Zealand. If I'm not uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, Korea too. And Korea too. Yeah. Uh, no, the uh, there was a very important statement on the 14th of February in uh, in Brussels following the meeting between Commissioner Breton and your Trade Minister. If I'm not wrong. Mm. Uh, whereby both parties committed to start uh, negotiations uh, uh, yeah. as soon as possible. I think there will be, the next step will be a technical workshop to be held here in, in Singapore mm. in, in a couple of months' time, and after that, uh, then normal proper negotiations might start. So there is a clear, a clear uh, uh, path according to which to, to, to engage for, for that. Okay. Um. Maybe we move on to the next set of uh, questions, which is basically uh, talking about how you know this uh, rules-based order or in rules-based international order. <sighs> yeah, you can't get away with this. I do the rules. Uh, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but they are now trying to hook this in with all the uh, other developments in the growth of the regional economy especially in Indo-Pacific, yeah. So when you say we can talk uh, trade negotiation on free trade agreement with individual ASEAN member states, uh, how do we find a way to draw in the rest? Uh, how would you hook up with existing ideas that we have now? Like, for example, we have the Regional Economic, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP, which ASEAN plus... Uh, five other guys in the region have really settled and it is supposed to be uh, operational uh, uh, after X number of people have signed on to it. Is there any thought about how do we hook on to such kind of uh, uh, big regional trade agreement with what you already have in uh, uh, Europe? I, I mean, it's, as far as I know, it, it's not on the table yet, but what I can tell you is on the table is a full uh, uh, openness to cooperation and, and, further, and further discussion to deepen it. So, uh, as I said, when we negotiate, the negotiations uh, will take care of what is brought, is, is brought on, the, on the table. So that's uh, as, as, simple, as, simple, as simple as that. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's two parties meeting and two parties putting on the table their, their issues or their concerns. So. I don't see why we should not discuss about this. It makes com completely okay. sense. Could be even interesting to, to examine it. Yeah. So we're going to have a lot of doing and flowing between us. Uh. 
not physical travel, but we can yeah, but using online negotiation. Ambassador, uh, the EU has a permanent ambassador to ASEAN. Yeah. And it's precisely his job to take care of the issues which come from ASEAN member states and from the ASEAN secretariat. So, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, okay, I'm sure I that Igor would be pleased to, to know that we are giving him some more work. Okay. And he's traveling to Singapore soon, so I'm, I'm sure you can have yeah. a, a, an interesting uh, exchange. Yeah, I, I will make sure that I, I will not meet him because he will ask me how to follow up on what you just said. <laughs> yeah. I will tell him to follow up on what I said then. Okay. Oh, I think we have one... Uh, hand raised here on on site here uh, viewers on online just hold on yeah let's go on to the second uh, questions from the floor here in uh, Fullerton Hotel yeah thank you very much ambassador and thank you also Mr. Vicentin uh, my name is Darren McDermott I'm the team leader of the EU support to higher education in the ASEAN region uh, program which works very closely with the EU delegation in Jakarta of course uh, ambassador Driesmans uh, and our colleagues at the ASEAN Secretariat, in fact, our, our offices within uh, the ASEAN Secretariat. Mm. So I wonder if we could bring uh, the attention uh, back a little bit to the people, people, people to people connectivity issues, and particularly higher education. Uh, do we see potential for uh, greater numbers of European students uh, traveling into ASEAN uh, to study? Uh, and also, can we expect to see uh, greater cooperation through digital modalities of, of higher education in the, the coming years under the new strategy? Thank you. Definitely. I think this, uh, uh, as I said, the, the, there was the decision to strengthen the, the, the Erasmus Plus and the, the Marie Curie Fellowship. So that goes very, very much in line of what you're saying. Obviously, as I said, this is still on... Uh, country to EU basis, it's not ASEAN to EU basis, uh, obviously. But definitely, it's, it's the ASEAN as a group can, can come forward with, with, with let's say, a, 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 a declaration of interest for, for this deepening of, 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 uh, of relations. I don't see any, uh, why not? And definitely, the idea of digitalizing this kind of, of exchanges is, is really worth noting. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that this is, uh, this is in, the, in, in the pipeline and it's well thought of, but I will surely report it to my colleague in both in DJAC and in DG Research. Yes, thank you very much for raising that. Gabriel, yes. many people want to know what exactly are the same thing in the ASEAN and the EU strategy or outlook on Indo-Pacific? I think that there are more similarities than differences. Uh, they, we actually uh, uh, like to refer to this uh, uh, ASEAN outlook as the ASEAN strategy for Indo-Pacific. We consider it as a, a, very, ch a very much like-minded uh, piece of, uh, of, uh, of uh, let's say, uh, political engagement. And uh, definitely, it's, it's based on an idea of uh, cooperation, uh, which has pillars. Uh, we have seven pillars. Now I can't remember how many the ASEAN has. But the key point, uh, which I would like really to, un to, to underline here, is that both uh, aim at an open cooperation. So both talk about cooperation and not confrontation. And this is what makes them very much alike. So cooperating with the ASEAN or cooperating with the EU does not mean enter into any kind of choice or either or. It means that you want to cooperate according to certain set of uh, 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 issues and rules, but this is not to the exclusion of other potential uh, uh, cooperation. And uh, again, it's both aim at cooperating and not confronting with other partners. So, and that's what makes us very much alike. Yeah, one of my researchers told me that your EU um, uh, strategy for Indo-Pacific talk a lot about cooperation rather than just being something different from others and open to other competitive dynamics. So congratulations on that count. Yeah. Um, there is another questioner on the floor here in Fullerton Hotel. Yes. Thank you. Uh, 
Ping Yong. Um, I'm Le Hui uh, from the EU Center. My question is, I'm, I've been working on EU-ASEAN relations, and it saddens me that um, the, the, in the most recent uh, uh, state of Southeast Asian uh, survey that was done by the ISIS uh, Yusuf Ishak uh, Institute, that um, so a year ago, I think uh, the EU was the most trusted partner to be a, to to support to be to be seen as a leader or champion for uh, for the rule based order and for free trade and all that. But that sub, that uh, has dropped to number three, I think. Uh, it's quite a drastic drop, especially for the one on free, the, the championing. Sorry, who is number one? Number one is the U.S. actually on championing the uh, free trade and all that, which is to me surprising. But I'm trying to get. <laughs> I, I don't understand. And number two. <laughs> Uh, China. <laughs> ah, okay. So we come after China. Okay. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, so. And you run the EU Center. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So. So she has a lot of work to do. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so my, I'm trying to understand why. So I'm trying to search for an answer. And one of my uh, theory is that uh, um, because the recent, uh, uh, you know, the, the 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 EU has been talking a lot about strategic autonomy, of course, mm. and of course before that it was primarily referring to in the security and defense. But recently, this idea of strategic autonomy, of course, and European sovereignty has been broadened to, 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 to concerns over supply chains, disruptions, and all that, right? So all this has led to, of course, a, a certain concern that is the EU going to be more using this in, in some way to become more protectionist. And whether that discussion then led to certain perceptions, right, about... Mm -hmm. Uh, the possibility of the, the EU turning more inward and hence not seen as a champion for uh, free trade and, and all that. So that's one. So how do you address that? Because I think that could be one yep. reason uh, that the, 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 the you know that it has been seen that the EU is turning away. So mm. going back to that and and talking about you talk about EU being a geopolitical uh, actor, but really I think EU can be more a geo economy because your strength is really in the economic arena, mm -hmm. being the the, the the most powerful trading bloc. So, are you considering then talk, taking on from what uh, King Yong has said about the the, the the fact that there are many uh, 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 mega trade agreements, CPTPP? So, you, you may think it's a bit far off, but would the EU consider, for instance, joining uh, CPTPP? Thank you. No, uh, first of all, uh, let allow me to clarify a couple of issues you raised because I think that there is a clear misperception of uh, what we mean by strategic autonomy. Uh, the, the concept of strategic autonomy was very well explained in a communication which came out very recently at the beginning of the year which is called the strategic compass. In there, it's clearly explained that the strate strategic autonomy uh, does not have to be considered as uh, an expression of the EU to be independent for its own security and defense. St the strategic autonomy is a concept which steps in uh, in uh, in uh, uh, complementary. It's it's a complementary concept towards the relation that the EU enjoys with NATO and, our, and other allies. Strategic autonomy means that the EU should be able to do, uh, uh, to take care of its, uh, of its uh, security when it's needed, but in cooperation with NATO. And I give you the clear example which drove us to formulate this notion of strategic autonomy. Uh, you all have in mind the images of the evacuation from Kabul uh, in mid uh, in mid August this year, okay, past year, uh, and the EU delegation personnel and the and the workers of the of the EU had to be evacuated from Afghanistan thanks to the American soldiers. So this led us to think that uh, it is important for the EU to have as well a rapid reaction force which could be deployed exactly for this kind of purposes. So it's a strate strategic autonomy which has to be relativized uh, in, its, in, its, uh, uh, in, its, in its magnitude. So we are talking about a few thousands of men uh, uh, ra being rapidly deployable. That's, that's the kind of strategic autonomy we are talking about. Uh, 
Uh, the supply chains, yes, uh, there is a clear need for diversification of supply chains, but this does not mean uh, protectionism. On the contrary, on the contrary, diversification of supply chains means even more trade, even with more country, differentiating the, the, the kind of dependency that the EU has. And we, for example, one striking example here for the region is the microchips. I mean, this is the, the clear uh, uh, need to differentiate the supply chains of, of, of microchips. So, not protectionism, even more trade. Yeah, that, that, that was the, uh, the uh, then what was the, your last question, I'm sorry? Ah, the CPTPP. Well, that's, uh, that's a very uh, interesting and challenging concept that, I, that my colleague back in Brussels at DG Trade in the Commission are surely thinking about, but uh, for the time being, uh, 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 it's, it's really not on the agenda. Thank you. Well, you can let the UK come in and uh, give you some practical uh, exposure to some of the experience that they will encounter because they are interested in uh, Good for them. Joining the CPTPP, right? Yeah. Good. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, are you satisfied with that, Dehui? Uh, and thanks a lot for the for the work you do for the promotion of the EU. Yeah. The survey is done by our think tank research institute here called the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies. Mm -hmm. And they do it yearly. It's called State of the Southeast Asia. Yeah. And they like to ask this kind of uh, hot question, who you like to love and who you trust most. Yeah. So it's not exactly something that we can confess honestly when we reply, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, if you're put on record, surely not. If you stay anonymous, <laughs> why not? <laughs> <laughs> okay, but you know, there are so many questions about uh, what is happening in Ukraine. But I think I must do justice to my role here. We are talking about Indo-Pacific and EU-ASEAN cooperation. So maybe just let us do one more um, question in this direction and then maybe we can close by letting you say a few things about what is happening on the Ukraine-EU uh, 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 sector. Um, here they have a question about uh, this notion of going digital cooperation, digital partnership. And then, as usual, they all wanted to know how are we going to negotiate our way with this uh, competition between the two big guys, uh, uh, namely starting with capital C and the other one starting with capital U. So Chinese-American competition on uh, technology and all that, and basically a lot to do with digital application. So. Is there a position that the EU can uh, discuss uh, here in our forum? Yeah, how do you navigate the EU position through all this uh, intensive competition that is now emerging between the United States and uh, China on the digital and technology front? Is there a magic formula that you can tell us in ASEAN so that we don't get into trouble with the Chinese or the Americans. Well, you know better. You know your business better than, than us on this, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. No, I mean, what, what, this is also what we refer to uh, uh, respecting the rules. I mean, when, when there are uh, rules on the international markets, uh, you have international fora where these, uh, these, these rules are, are set out. Uh, competition. One should not be afraid of competition. I mean, uh, comp competition is good. If you are if you are good at competing, uh, you are you deserve to 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 reach uh, uh, to reach the markets and to reach your position in the markets. Something was is when you abuse of uh, of your positions or where you uh, exert co economic coercion to 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 achieve dominant positions. That's that's an issue, but I don't see that a competition per se is bad, on the contrary. So, uh, we don't have a magic stick, but as you, you said it before, the EU has a, a clear, uh, is, a, is a, an economic superpower, but above all is a regulatory power. So, our, our, our power is uh, founded in the rules that we give to each other to rule our internal market and to rule our free trade uh, uh, agreements, which encompass as well uh, uh, digital, but uh, this is if you if I can give you a, a um, 
my view is based on the EU's experience, uh, whereby uh, uh, a good regulatory environment uh, uh, avoids you problems uh, 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 in the future. In a similar vein, I had a question prepared by my researcher, wanting you to talk a little bit about your green plan in the EU. We never talk about... Mm. We, we have to cover uh, something about the green plan or green transition. Otherwise, I, when I get out there, there will, you know, people don't believe it. We do have advocacy groups in Singapore. They, <laughs> they, this discussion about Indo-Pacific and EU did not touch about climate change and green plan. <laughs> what, what, what can you say? No, what, no. what you want to do with us in ASEAN? Well, above all, the promotion of green economy is vital. The fight against climate change is vital. The work on the reduction of uh, climate change caused uh, natural disasters is vital, as well as the monitoring and the early response to this is vital as well. Uh, so uh, what we are doing, in, the EU has given itself uh, a, a clear policy. Uh, it's, it will be the overarching uh, policy for the next years. Uh, it's, it's a shift total shift towards a green economy, it's called Green Europe. Um, we are pushing this agenda forward in every possible way, internally and externally. Uh, in COP26, we were staunch defenders of climate neutrality and we tried to push this forward in every possible aspect. Uh, so, um, we consider COP26 result, uh, of course, not the best possible, but surely an encouraging start. So as uh, our vi Vice President said, uh, Timmermans. Um, so we will pursue that internationally. Um, as you know, one of the seven priorities of the EU Indo-Pacific strategy is climate. And, and there uh, we pursue this uh, on every, uh, uh, in every aspect. So from the reduction of CO2 emission, to the uh, to the monitoring and answer to, to to natural to natural disasters, and also to connectivity, because when we talk about building new infrastructures, the, this new infrastructure will have to comply with uh, green standards, uh, will have to comply with high standards or environmental protections, and uh, all the new infrastructure built uh, in terms of energy. Or, or pure transport infrastructure, we have to respect environmental concerns. And, uh, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, is, is by, by, comes by definition, because we are pushing the, the green economy, uh, let's say, as our key priority for the next 20 years, basically. Okay. I think we have to respond to at least four questions on the online. Uh, a platform from uh, people wanting to ask about what EU is doing about Ukraine now. Yeah, how do you take this matter forward? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I would like uh, to say more, but it's precisely by the time we are talking, the president of the Commission is is giving a, a press a conference. So. Uh, I, I am following, you know, Europe is seven hours ahead of us, so it's, uh, it's, it was uh, still uh, very early in this morning when, when I read the first reaction, so it's exactly what uh, uh, Ivona uh, uh, told us. Um, what I can tell you is that there is this press uh, 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 conference by the President of the Commission. There will be an extraordinary summit called by President Michel. Uh, what I could foresee is that the leaders will agree uh, on 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 uh, on uh, on uh, measures which had been hinted to by the high representative and the by and by the commission president in their previous statements so they were saying still uh, when the mili when the russian when the russian action limited itself to the to the two uh, breakaway regions uh, they said that uh, uh, there will be there was a first package of sanctions on its way but there would be others uh, literally, there were other ammunitions in our, at our disposal should uh, uh, Russia increase its military offensive. So I would predict that uh, uh, within the course of the day, there will be further section, sanctions decided uh, against, uh, against uh, Russia. I cannot uh, predict which ones precisely, but uh, what 
uh, had been previously announced is that there would be very severe and hard hitting. Um, so this is, uh, uh, this is all I can tell you, but really the situation is evolving by the hours and, and we really have to see uh, after the press conference of the, of, uh, of the President of the Commission and after, above all, the extraordinary summit called by President Michel. Okay. Maybe on that vein, any one of you but, here? Uh, yeah. Excuse me, on this. This is again a respect of international rules-based order. Mm -hmm. What's happening in Ukraine is a blatant evidence of non-respect of international law, is a blatant uh, evidence of non-respect of the EU, UN Charter, it's a blatant non-respect of national sovereignty of one state. And this is a lesson which is learned in Eastern Europe, but it should be learned as well for the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So it, even if it's 10,000 kilometers away from here, it tells us and speaks to us very, very, very clearly. Thank you. Anyone from the... Oh, you... Okay. Uh, Dr. Yo want to ask another question from Fullerton Hotel. No, I just wanted to find out if there is any uh, concrete follow-up for the, after the meeting. Is there a commitment to have an, an, another meeting? What meeting? Or to have it the, the uh, ministerial forum? Is there a commitment to, to have regular meetings? for? It depends on the, who is the president of the EU, right? <laughs> Not, not, not really. There's not a commitment, but there is uh, an idea uh, which has been brought forward that this could be the first of a series, indeed. Uh, but there's no been formal commitments or announcements. But we are, we are, uh, we are thinking about it. It was mentioned in the conclusions by the French minister that the Paris Forum uh, was something. Uh, very important in terms of content, but also in terms of, he said, method de travail, so a working method. That could be an inspiring working method. But still, it's very vague, and, and we still have to see how this will go on. Anyhow, uh, for the future presidencies of the EU, uh, the momentum on Indo-Pacific will be kept, because the uh, uh, Czechia has appointed a special envoy for Indo-Pacific of its own, whom I met, whom I'm in direct contact with, and whom I will meet again in, in Prague next uh, Friday, uh, in order exactly to uh, agree on uh, a list of activities and events to be undertaken also under the Czech presidency. So this is the uh, next presidency of the EU. Of the EU. And after then, France is Czech Republic. Yes, and after, and after it, Ambassador, they want to be called Czechia. They don't want to be called anymore Czech Republic. Oh. Yeah. It's easier for us. Yes. It's only five letter words. So, check, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but the acronym still stays CZ, so that's okay. <laughs> uh, but then, on top of that, we also have a clear commitment by the Swedish, which is the presidency after the Czechs, uh, to take over also Indo-Pacific items, and they will organize even a major event in Stockholm during their presidency. Uh, we are not sure yet whether... Uh, they will be forum or ministerial forum because uh, that's not, uh, to me, it, it should be not done too often. Mm -hmm. uh, but for sure, for sure, there will be, uh, the, the attention will be very high also with the next presidencies uh, of the EU. I think that is good for us, uh, Dr. Yo Lehui, because I think in the ASEAN uh, vision, the plan is to uh, increase our cooperation in certain defined sector under the AOIP. And many of these sectors are in line with what the Europeans have in mind too. So it's uh, something uh, positive for us. Uh, the broad category of work that we can do together, uh, there are what we call convergences and uh, similarities. Yeah, And uh, that would be quite good. And from what you just said, for the next uh, one year after France, you have Czechs and you have the Swedes. Yeah, so there is a rather uh, long uh, um, path across uh, in this uh, particular cooperative sector. True, and if you allow me, Ambassador, on this, I would like to stress something which is very, very important. It's not just a matter of presidencies. The Indo-Pacific 
policy of the EU is based actually on two sets of decisions. Uh, the one we are talking about is the joint communication by the High Representative and the Commission, which was published in September. So it's the EU strategy for cooperation on the Indo-Pacific. But I would like to draw your attention to the fact that in April 2021, there were unanimously adopted conclusions by the Foreign Affairs Council of the EU. So all the EU foreign affairs ministers agreed on conclusions on the Indo-Pacific. So it's really not a matter of single presidency to take over the Indo-Pacific. These were unanimously adopted conclusions on the Indo-Pacific. So all the EU member states decided about the importance and relevance of the, the Indo-Pacific. Yeah? So it's, it's really an important, an important uh, point that I wanted to make. Yeah, and we hope that you can tell all your EU colleagues that inside this Indo-Pacific, ASEAN is the centre. So it's very important for us. Definitely. Yeah. But it's already, <laughs> it's already said in many, many times, both in the conclusions of the ministers and in the communication. It's and also in the ASEAN sector, we are almost 70% uh, seas and ocean. So maritime domain is very important for us. Yep. Yeah. And I think there are many things that we can do together. Yeah, I mean, ocean to governance is one of the topics uh, with it's not just uh, freedom of navigation it's also about uh, fight against pl plastic pollution it's also yeah. fight against yeah. illegal fishing yeah. it's about the uh, uh, capacity building of the coast guards to monitor what's happening at sea and there for example i'm talking about the crimario project which uh, which singapore has a big stake in so it's it's really a comprehensive approach uh, yeah. towards towards the region the ASEAN leaders have basically now moved their focus onto the ASEAN agreement on how to manage this challenge from the marine pollution. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, how do we maintain the uh, unique ASEAN uh, biodiversity in our oceans? Yes. So I think the next uh, few years, we will see quite a few activities in this area and hopefully we can uh, learn from the EU experiences, uh, especially in terms of the way to develop the relevant rules and regulation. And more importantly, how do we resolve our uh, differences? Because uh, one thing about the rules-based order is the idea about resolving differences or dispute peacefully and according to the rules. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and we're agreeing on mechanism to solve different views. That's the key point. Yeah. Because it's not just enough, for example, gi I give you an example, it's not just enough to be part of UNCLOS. Yeah. You have also to accept the dispute resolution mechanism of UNCLOS. Uh, and this also applies in, 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 in for every kind of uh, international environment. So personally, I always thought that I, because I was trained as a lawyer, hmm? yeah, I so always, was I. Uh, I always feel that what is important about the rules-based order uh, is not just the rules about X, Y, Z. More importantly, the rules-based order uh, they usually have a provision for dispute settlement, the process itself, the way to get there, and the culture of accepting what is the right thing to do, and finding way for the other guys that have been ruled to be uh, required to follow certain sets of uh, understanding, that is more important than just simply whether this is blue or red, square or all around. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, the signal is that the time is almost up. Right. Yeah. But, uh, hey, you had to say something about Ukraine, you know. All the five, six questions here. Anything else you want to add on, uh, Gabriel, before you go and uh, uh, have the rest of Singapore under your vision? Yeah. Uh, many questions about Ukraine. What are the lessons learned or what are the lessons that ASEAN should learn from this experience? I mean, the main, the main lesson, uh, but it's not for ASEAN, it's universal, is that uh, when different views uh, should be solved by diplomacy and negotiations and not by the use of force. That's, that's as simple as that. 
Thank you so very much, Ambassador Ong King Yong and Mr. Vicentin, for your insights and really stressing where cooperation can bring us and not confrontation. Uh, you spoke about love and you said one cannot openly profess love, but I can tell you I have really loved the insightful conversation we've had, uh, uh, sometimes heated in, in the cold Fullerton room. So I thank you both for your time and to our audience who's present with, here, with us here today and those of you who have joined us online. Thank you so very much on behalf of the European Union delegation to Singapore for your time and your attention. Thank you all. Thank you all.